Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Let us continue our discussion on trusses and in the last class we had discussed uh, method of joints and I have said that I would prefer cutting and isolating a joint like this. This becomes easier when you want to associate the final answer of these forces as tension or compression in the members. It becomes very clear when I look the member like this, if I have a force acting away from the joint, it indicates tension. And the mathematics uh, tells me if I have assumed it in a particular way, the algebra tells me whether I should retain that or change its orientation. If I have a force towards the joint, it is also very clear the member is under compression. But I have said many books simply isolate a joint as a circle and then indicate the forces. Algebraically you will get the same numbers, you will not make any mistakes there. But when you evaluate the forces and try to associate whether it is a tension or compression, you have to follow a convention. Because when I take a joint like this, suppose you start thinking how the pin joint behaves, then you would put tension like this. But if I have to associate the direction, I will have to put these forces at the joint only in the direction of the members. All that restriction is not there when I simply isolate a joint and put the forces acting away from the member. It is very clear that this is tension even when you perceive it. So, if I start my forces like this, my mathematics when I get the answer as negative, you can also associate that as compression. So, it has a slight advantage from physical visualization and secondly, you do not worry about how the joint has been made. So, the choice is yours which is the way that you would like to solve the problem in trusses. Next we analyze the same truss by another method called method of sections. The focus is to learn the methodology. So, I have taken the same truss and the question is you have to find out the internal force only in one member F E. I do not have to find out forces in all members and the member is specified and the question also says use just one equation by the method of sections. We have already looked at this truss, we have done the free body diagram, we have also checked for determinacy and indeterminacy, all that I am not going to repeat. One of the key aspect here is. I have to pass an imaginary section and cut the truss into two. How do I take the section? When I take a section, it should completely cut the truss. I cannot cut one member or I trim the member. When you say method of section, simply go and trim one member that is not acceptable. If I put a cut, the cut should pass only once in a member and usually books will give a straight line cut like this and when I isolate this, I should put the force interaction of these members indicated as forces acting away from the member. 
which would also say that I am assuming it as tension. If my algebra gives this as negative, I would understand that this is giving a compressive force of the momentum. Now, the question is you have to come out of the mental block, how do I make a cut? It need not be a vertical line, it can be an inclined line. Here again I indicate the force as F, F, E, F, B, E, F, B, C and so on. Wherever I cut the member, the internal force remains same because I have considered this as a two force member. No matter where I cut, the internal force remains same. And I can also take a generic curve because soon we are going to see one more problem where the challenge is how to take an appropriate section. In fact, that would require a curved line. So, you have to visualize when I take a section, the only restriction is I should completely cut the truss and isolate. I cannot go and cut the member Fe and Be alone and say that I have done the method of section. No, you have to separate it into two. So, when I take the section like this, I would have <coughs> force interaction represented like this and I could also have another line like this. This is also going to give me a similar free body diagram. So, I could use any one of these free body diagrams for me to apply the method of sections. They are one and the same. The focus of this is to indicate I could have even a curve like this to cut a truss. So, I am prompting you when you have a problem later, if you can have a wavy cut, if it is going to simplify the problem, go ahead and choose it. Method of section does not say you have to put a straight line. Now, now, now let us solve the problem. For solving, I will simply take a vertical cut and then separate this into two. So, I could write the free body of the left portion or I could also write the free body of the right portion. Whichever is convenient to you, you can do that. There is no hard and fast rule which one you should use. In a given problem, which would simplify your mathematical calculation that you choose it. And we have also seen in the question, I should find out the force F, F e by using just one equation. What is the difference between method of joints and method of sections? When I isolate a joint, I get a concurrent force system. I can write only two equations of equilibrium because the moment equation is automatically satisfied. On the other hand, when I use method of sections, the force system is not concurrent. So, I can use sigma f x equal to 0, sigma f i equal to 0 and sigma m z equal to 0. I can use all the three equations and do not jump to use all the three equations without pondering about how to handle the problem. Because in the examinations, you know, I would uh, give a problem and we also indicate what is the maximum mark you can get for that problem. The mark is indicative of the time that you should try to spend on a problem. If you think that you are spending more time on it, then you have missed the crux of the problem in solving. Here the problem is very straightforward and I am sure everyone would be able to see what is the equation I should use. Simply take the moment about uh, the point B the forces F B and F B C do not contribute anything. I can directly write one equation and get the value of force F F E. And this gives me as uh, minus 2 kilo Newton. And when you say minus, we have already taken a clever way of representing the forces. Even without visualization, you could conclude that 
the force is compressive on the member. But I would urge you to visualize because the whole course is you have to be prompted to visualize what happens in actual situation when the loads are applied. Take mathematics as a support, as a verification tool. It should go hand in hand with your visualization. So, we have minus 2 kilo Newton and uh, the direction is also changed and I finally put the value as 2 kilo Newton compress it. Then we move on to another important aspect which we have ignored, how to model weight of members. Just modeling the weight of members may not be a real issue. See, if you go to western countries where you have uh, very cold temperatures and you have usually snow falls on all the roofs, snow could be very heavy and depending on the intensity, you may have to design the roof truss so that you take into account the effect of snow in some way. And as I said, the self weight of the members are small compared to the external load. And why we have carefully avoided self-weight? Actually, self-weight can introduce a small bending of the members, which we have never considered it for simplicity in the analysis. And if you look at how the joints are made, if I put rivets one after the other, they can also suppose, support a moment. And such effects are generally neglected in the analysis. You get a result which is reasonably acceptable. That is why that approximation is valid. If it is not acceptable, you cannot make an approximation. The approximation should be acceptable for a given application. As I said, uh, when there is a snowfall on rooftops, one may need to account for the weight of snow. And here again, we are going to make an approximation. Suppose I look at that this is the weight, you could visualize the body force acting on each volume element of the body or you could also consider a distributed force due to snow. Either of the two you can handle it in a similar fashion. And what would we normally do? We replace the weight through the centroid and indicate by the weight. This weight could accommodate only the member weight or it could be member weight plus no or it could be just no. How do we take it in our uh, analysis? We have already seen I can analyze a truss only if the loads are applied at the joints. No member is continuous through the joint. Suppose I have this load to be considered in totality, you will have a force like this and this would introduce a bending. Instead, what is accepted in an engineering analysis is, you lump half of this weight on this joint and lump half of this weight on this joint. This kind of an approach is acceptable in engineering analysis because it simplifies your mathematical calculations, yet it gives an improved estimate of member forces. So, I caution that this is only an approximation. Suppose I want to accommodate the weight of this member, I could put forces like this. Suppose I want to accommodate the weight of this member, I should put the forces like this. Suppose I want to accommodate the weight of this member, I have to put the forces like this. On the other hand, if I have snow, you have to be careful which of the members are loaded, fine. And this you can carry on and uh, complete for all other joints. So, this is called lumping of the weight of the members and it does improve the estimation of average axial forces. So, it is acceptable you still maintain your simplicity of your analysis 
and slightly improve our estimates. And now we will move on to solving another problem. You have already looked at the method of joints as well as method of sections. You have a truss like this, make a neat sketch of it. You have this supported on hinges or pin joint at one end and a roller support at the other end. And the question is, I have to find out the member forces of only three members. I have the member BC, I have the member BJ and I have the member BK. The choice is yours, whether you want to use method of joints or method of sections, you should use them judiciously, either one of it or combination of this and ultimately get these member forces as efficiently as possible. Even before we solve the problem, let us set a target that we would use for each unknown one equation to solve. Can we set that as a target for us to aid our thinking? So, I am going to greatly reduce my mathematical calculation effort and I look for which way I should have the strategy to solve the problem. So, my recommendation is when you look at a problem in your exams, ponder about how to go about using your mathematics. Do not jump on immediately you start from one corner and then take consume half an hour of the examination completely on your solving only one problem. Do not do that mistake. You have to decide on a strategy. So, now I have set the goal. I have three member forces to be determined. We will try to find out whether we could solve them by just three equations. And I would like you to get the habit of looking at whether the problem is solvable from equations of statics or not. So, we will check for determinacy or indeterminacy. So, you have to get the number of joints, you could count them as 11 and I have uh, groups of 6. So, 3 into 6 18 plus 1 19 members I have and since I have a pinned joint at one end and a roller support at one end, you have just 3 reactions and if I check m plus r, it does equal 2j. It is very obvious in this case, see if I have a truss which has essentially triangular shape in every section of it, no cross braced members and the two supports, one of them is a pinned joint and the other one is a roller support, invariably it will be a statically determinate problem. But it is better when you are learning the subject, check this for each of the problems you solve, you get the training to do that. Now, the next job is, should we find out the reactions or should we directly go and find out the member forces? I said that I have set the goal as I need to have only 3 equations to solve for 3 unknowns. So, that indirectly implies can we avoid finding out the reactions. See, when I discussed the first problem, I said it is desirable to find out the reactions. So, it is uh, context based. If I have to find out all the member forces, find out the reactions and go from one joint to another joint and then estimate all the forces. In this case, it is desirable that I look at the method of sections and the first aspect that you have to pay attention is, what is the kind of section that is appropriate for this problem. Make an attempt on it, make an attempt on it. The whole problem depends on a nice section that you have to select. See normally in method of sections, I have said that I can have 3 equations when I separate it. So, cut a section that will have only 3 unknowns. 
I can give a hint, I relax that condition. You can have more number of unknowns also. So, that is a clue for you to arrive at a section and I have already trained you that a section can be a curved line. So, the second clue is it is not a straight line, it is a curved line. You have to choose the type of section appropriately. The moment you take the right section, the problem is solved. The crux in this problem is how to identify a suitable section which would help me to determine the unknowns. So, I have to bring in once I cut the section, how do I take the moments? Can I find out some nice locations which would minimize the calculation? Because when I say a body is in equilibrium, I can take moment about any point. I can take the moment on any of the points on the body or even outside the body and then satisfy. So, you would use all these principles in trying to do that. Let me ask a question. We have to find out the forces on member BC, BJ and BK. Can I take a section and cut these three members? Do not do that because by cutting only these three members, I am not going to separate the truss into two. Whatever section I take, I should be able to analyze that as one free body, I should be able to analyze the other cut as another free body, it should be completely separated. Have any one of you figured out uh, what is the section that you can think of? I said that you do not have to have a straight line, it has to be a wavy and I have also relaxed another condition. It can also cut more members, more than three. To be specific, you can cut four members. Let me give the other clue also. Because in a problem like this, you can have multiple ways of solving it. There is no one standard way to solve a problem. You have to apply your mind and then find out what it is. And I say that I can cut four members, that means four unknowns. How do I solve four unknowns with only three possible equations? It is still possible if you take the point about which you take the moment cleverly. So, the focus in taking this problem is to pay attention on strategies to solve a problem. You know how to in general apply a method of joints or method of section, you also know the equilibrium equations. So, you have to weigh between what would you select and which equation you would ultimately use for solving. We have spent sufficient time on this, let me show the section. I will take a section like this and what I am going to do is I will separate this. So, when I look at this free body, first thing is I do not have to find out the reactions to solve this free body. I could solve the problem by solving the upper part or the lower part. I cleverly take the upper part because I do not want to determine the reactions because the question is only to find out forces in three members. But here I have the force FCB, FCJ, FGJ, FGH, they are four in number. From the principle of statics, I can write only three equations. But if I take a point about which I take a moment, I can straight away knock off three forces. Can you see that? So, the focus is you think and solve the problem. Do not simply take a section and uh, do it in a hurry. So, in my questions, the mark is an indicator how much time I expect you to spend. It is an indirect guidance for you to solve a problem. If you are taking more time, then you have missed the crux of the problem. 
So revisit it and then see how you can do this. So I have complete the free body here. I have also put the known forces. And it is very clear if I take moment about g, I have my problem is set and I can directly find out what is the force in member B C. Is the idea clear? It is a very nice problem that is what I said to learn a subject select few key problems understand the methodology thoroughly, learn the concepts, you can solve any problem in that chapter. So, if I do this, I get F B C into 2 plus 10 into 2 minus 10 into 1.5, you have to do this carefully, you have to do this carefully when I take moment about the point G, these 3 and this one, they do not contribute to the bending moment. So, I have these 2 forces only contribute to this and this unknown force and this force also does not contribute to bending moment. So, if I take this, you should be very careful in applying these condition looking at all the known and unknown forces, do not miss out any one of them. So, we have been able to find out the force F B C and I get this as uh, minus 2.5 kilo Newtons. So, I indicated uh, on the diagram and we will also reverse it and then put the sign and this indicates that the member B C is under compression. Then we have to find out uh, the member forces B J and B K. How do we go about? I have taken one section. See, these sections are imaginary. So, the do not have a mental block. I have taken the problem, I put one section, solved it. I should not use method of sections again. There is nothing like that. I can take another imaginary cut and determine the member force. And here I say you can also cut four members, and the clue is it can be a straight cut. Can you guess which cut will you select? Because in method of sections, you have to identify what is the section I should take. Because you also want to solve a problem in a reasonable length of time. I would simply put a horizontal cut. Here again I have 1, 2, 3, 4, even though I cut 4 members, I have determined the member force here. Tell me about which point should I take the moment. Let me complete the free body diagram. I should show the known and unknown forces clearly. And Please note that I have indicated the force correctly on the member B C because I have already determined its uh, magnitude as well as direction and that is indicated correctly. I can easily find out for the member force F B J and you have to tell me which should be the point of taking the moment because it is a nice training. It is nothing but equilibrium of rigid bodies and you learn many of important concepts even while solving a problem on truss. I can take moment about any point. In the previous case, we took point lying on the truss. The clue now is it is lying outside the section at an appropriate place. If you look at the truss, it will still lie on the truss. But from a section is concerned, it is still outside the section. Have you figured out what is that you will take? Yeah, very good. So, I will take H because I have uh, these two four unknown forces uh, do not contribute moment about this point. And from geometry, you have to find out this angle. See, you are given uh, 
this height as 1.5 meters and this is symmetric so it is 1 meter. So, I can find out what is this angle. Some computation you may have to do and I would urge that from uh, next class onwards please bring your calculators and you could verify whether my arithmetic is all right. Okay. And if I put sigma m h equal to 0, I get the equation like this. I get this as f b j cos 56.3 into 1.5 plus f b j sin 56.3 into 1 minus 2.5 into 2, 10 into 1.5 minus 10 into 3 plus 10 into 2 equal to 0. So, while writing this equation, accommodate both unknown and known forces carefully. It is like solving any other isolated section. Here the section is cut on the member and you are accommodating for all the forces and this has to remain in equilibrium. So, with this I am in a position to evaluate F B J by another equation and that turns out to be 18.02 kilo Newton. Please verify that this arithmetic is all right. Now, what is left? I have to find out force in member B k. Is there any restriction that I start with method of sections, I should not touch method of joints? There is nothing like that. You utilize both these methods judiciously to solve a given problem. Your goal is you have learnt methodologies apply the methods to solve a given problem. So, the next clue is I would isolate a joint and find out the force in member B k and in this case it also becomes very obvious which joint should I isolate. I put the free body diagram of this. See the methodology I have adopted in isolating a joint is so convenient physically you can appreciate what it is and there is no great difference between what I do for method of section and for what I do for method of joints. So, it is much more convenient to handle that way and this is fairly straightforward and you would be in a position to find out. what is the value of the force F B k and you get this as minus 25 kilo Newtons and uh, you put this uh, towards a joint and we have determined the forces on three members using just three equations and judiciously using a combination of method of sections and method of joints. I would urge you to take this kind of an approach in minimizing your mathematics. It's, I can also solve the problem by method of joints going from one joint to another joint take half an hour to 45 minutes still I will get the same answer. And this just uh, summarizes what we have done in method of sections. So, we take a suitable imaginary section which need not be a straight line and force system acting on this is non-concurrent. So, I can use three independent equations. So, generally you choose a section where three members whose forces are unknown are cut, but we have seen a special case where we had more unknowns, but we utilize the equilibrium equations appropriately particularly the moment equilibrium. So, we could still get the answer even with four members. That means, one of the members will be able to cal calculate. Still, you will have the difficulty. If you have to find out for all the unknowns, then it may not be sufficient. So, you should look at in that context. And we have also discussed on what should be the sign convention I should use. So, that I am able to associate the member force as tension or compression on the actual truss member. 
Then we move on to another important aspect, how do I identify zero force members? I have a situation like this at joint A, I do not have a force acting at joint A, external force, I have only members connected here. Can you tell me which is a zero force member? It is obvious, I have no vertical component of force acting on the joint externally. So, obviously, if I put sigma F i equal to 0, I get F a d should go to 0. So, even by inspection, you can identify what is a zero force member. And people ask me, what do I do with the zero force members? I said from the stability point of view, you cannot remove the zero force member and you should also recognize for the given loading, this member is not carrying any load. But you know very well, I always have these structures available in the open because you, you, you see trusses are used for stadium and bridges and so on. In many of these applications, you also have forces due to wind that keep changing the direction. For the given loading, this member transmits zero force. For another loading, this member may carry a force. From that point of view also, you should not remove zero force members. But particularly from stability point of view, you cannot remove even for a given loading, when the member is transmitting zero force, they should be retained. Suppose I have a joint like this, I have FAB and FAD forces acting like this and there is no external force acting at joint A, which are zero force members? Both of them are. This is to remove your mental block. We took one example of a truss in that it so happened one member was zero force. In a truss, you can have several members carrying no load, okay. several members may be zero force members. Then we, we move on to another uh, aspect, how do we handle statically indeterminate stresses? See the idea is, if I have to analyze beyond the purview of statics, I have to bring in deformation in my analysis and we said that we are going to analyze bodies as rigid. Nevertheless, certain class of problems you can still handle. One class is, <coughs> if I have external redundancy, if I have more external supports than are necessary to ensure a stable equilibrium configuration, I cannot solve using the principle of statics. Suppose the loading is very simple. I have taken the same truss which we have analyzed it earlier. We had pin joint here. Originally, we had a roller support. Now, I have replaced by a pin joint, but I still retain the same vertical force. I can still solve this problem even though it has external redundancy. If the loading is simple, if there is no horizontal component, I can make a reasonable ass assumption that there are no horizontal in interaction of forces at these two supports. I can still solve the problem. So, this is one class of problems you can uh, handle. Other important class of uh, problems is when I have internal redundancy. I have more members than what is actually necessary. You know, we have seen the failure of TACOM on Arrows Bridge and I said one of the problems that precipitated was forces due to wind. Then people learned that they have to do something for the wind forces and we saw cross bracing in many of the practical bridges. You had seen in the first class when we discussed how trusses are constructed. So, I have uh, cross brace structures and what I have here is you should see clearly that there is no circle put here. So, the member is continuous, they are not joined here. Okay. And what I bring in is, 
the wind changes direction. So, depending on the wind force, it will deflect in a particular manner and we have already seen that these cross brace members are much lighter than the actual members of the truss and I said we have put a string in one of the classes and shown that it simply buckles if it is subjected to compression. So, it can take only tensile forces. So, I can use this if I consider that the diagonal members are flexible cables, if they could be flexible or behave in a sense flexible from the overall truss point of view. I have thin members doing this. So, even though I have this member, I would ignore the presence of this member and determine the force as if this member is not present. But you have to verify later by taking that this member is present, the other member is absent and find out whether the force is indeed tension or compression. If it is compression, your original assumption is correct. We will also take up a problem and then understand this. And I have already said that these are necessary to bear wind loads because they keep changing direction. You do not know which way the wind will blow. So, I should have cross braced members. So, with the, when the wind force direction changes, one of the members will come into play, structure will be safe, the bridge will not collapse. It, uh, two days back there was a storm and one of the bridge connecting uh, France and Italy has uh, collapsed. So, do not think that uh, failures happen in the past, they can happen even now. So, you have to design it properly. So, I have a, another truss which has uh, cross brace members. In this illustration, I have shown it uh, thick, but we have seen in all the earlier uh, actual structure of a truss, they were shown deliberately as thin. So, imagine that these are the flexible, but I am making an assumption that they are flexible and doing it, both are equally good. And I also have modeling of the wind load for this application. On that day, wind was blowing from right to left. Okay. So, what I can do is, I will uh, have the free body diagram where I will have the support forces. Now, I have four uh, unknowns at the supports. I have the wind forces like this and I will have to do whether the problem is statically determinate or indeterminate. I should find out the number of joints and number of members and number of unknowns. So, when I do that, I will find that this is a statically indeterminate problem and I will have you can do that calculation, you I will have uh, the number of unknowns are 4, which I will not be in a position to find out, but I can still solve for this problem by making an assumption under the given action of these wind forces, the deflection could be like this. So, what I would do is, I would make this member absent in my free body and estimate the member forces. What I assume is only this member is present and it is taking tension and the deformation of the truss element is like this. That comes from physics of the problem. So, I bring in additional information from the deformed picture. You have to visualize what way the deformation could be. I assume it like this and this is reasonably ok because of the wind loads are the very clearly specified. If they are not specified, then you may have to verify by the other way of deformation and find out which is under tension and which is under compression. So, I do this equilibrium of this joint, so that I do not have this member present in my analysis. So, I can directly find out what is uh, the 
force in the member FDE and you could get this, these are the compression and I find out the equilibrium of joint D. The focus here is I would essentially get the value of the force acting on the member DF as positive. If my result is positive, what I have started is ok, but still it is not completely verified. For the given loading, it is so simple, I am able to visualize the deformation. Suppose I also have some loads acting from right to left, but I have major load acting from, from uh, this direction, you may not be able to visualize clearly. So, you may have to verify both the cases and find out which is the actual deformation for the given loading. That I leave it as an exercise to you. You may wonder with the advent of computers, how do we go and do the analysis? We have seen bridges having hundreds of members, you cannot solve them manually, it will take a lot of time and we have also made consciously several simplified assumptions to solve a problem. And what is done in uh, computer based analysis is the force displacement relations for each member is expressed in a matrix form, then you form a global matrix, there is a methodology called uh, finite element methods and you have matrix theory of structural analysis. It was started by civil engineers, then now it is popular as a finite element method and you can solve the global matrix and get the evaluation of displacement at the joints. From the displacement find out the member forces and also find out the stresses and you can also improve the idealizations because we have said that this is a pin joint and I have always been saying in reality the joints are very, very complex. Okay. So, you can improve the idealization of these joints better in computer analysis and you should also keep in mind this I have emphasized it several times. In real life, every pin connection in the actual structure can take some moment due to friction. So, you cannot idealize something as a true pin joint. If you look at fixed joint, are they really fixed? They can also allow some small rotary motion. So, it is always debatable whether a physical structure, a joint or a support, does it actually behave like a pin joint or a fixed support. So, this is where I said you have lower bound solution and upper bound solution. So, you have to do the analysis in either way and estimates the load carrying capacity. And by making this as a pin joint, we have removed one unknown. I have only two unknowns per joint. So, that also simplifies the analysis. And you have to do the idealization with care. And computers allow advantage to be taken of the additional stiffness that comes from riveted, bolted or welded connections. And you should also keep in mind analysis of pin jointed trusses are now limited to engineering education. So, do not think that actual trusses people ignore the stiffness introduced because of joints, these are efficiently modeled. So, you do not have to worry about it. And this shows a nice uh, animation of the trusses. Because the whole idea is, I said whatever you learn in engineering mechanics is a initial data that you get for your next level course. The next level course, you have to find out what is the cross section I should use. And here you have two trusses, one is having a cross section of 10 millimeter square, another is double the cross section. And you see the maximum deflection is 0 0.0308 millimeter, so this is highly, highly exaggerated. In another case, the deflection is only 0 0.0154 and if you look at this Young's modulus, this is made of steel, it is 210 GPA and you could see very clearly 
the deformation is more here and deformation is less here. Suppose I change the material, I retain the cross section, but I change the material what happens? I have uh, now selected aluminum which is 70 GPA and retained the 10 millimeter uh, square as the cross sectional area and you would see a large difference which is seen in the deformed picture. I have a maximum deflection of 0 0.093. So, you get an idea you evaluate the member forces ultimately you have to select what should be the cross section of the member and what should be the material it should be made of, fine. That is the ultimate purpose of it. The first step is to find out the member forces that you learn in this course. And we have also made a statement that trusses are efficient. Do not you think that before we close our discussion on trusses, why they are efficient? See, truss is subjected to axial forces, it is subjected to either tension or compression. On the other hand, when the member behaves like a beam, it is bent. The way member resists the loads are different in tension as well as bending. And suppose I take a generic section, imagine that this is a long member, I have taken a section and if I look at what is the resistance, it would appear like this for a truss member. From this you cannot conclude anything. Suppose we want to look at what happens if this behaved like a beam, the resistance at this cross section, internal resistance that is developed varies in a triangular fashion. And what happens in this? Cross section is fully utilized in load transfer. The central core does not take any load when the member is bent. So, that is the reason why trusses are more efficient and you cannot conclude that I do not have a load carrying in the beam, so I should not have any beams. It is also having a purpose. Even if you look at God's creation, all your bones are hollow. When you walk up the stair and come down, your thigh bones are subjected to bending and torsion. And you know very well your hemoglobin is uh, uh, created only in the bone marrow. Bone marrow is very soft, bone is very hard. So, you should not have any load in the inner core. That is why God clearly, cleverly made your body where uh, you, God has understood bending and torsion much before as mechanics people we are trying to unravel. So, in this chapter, we have looked at uh, trusses, we have seen how they are constructed. The key point is no member is continuous through a joint and loads are applied only at the joints. For analysis and to determine the forces, we have learned two methods, method of joints and method of sections. In a given problem, you could freely choose either one of the methods or a judicious combination to solve the problem as quickly as possible. And uh, we have also discussed at length how to associate your member forces as tension or compression. Thank you.